Reina Grande, what is El Otro Lado? El Otro Lado, well, the way I grew up knowing El Otro Lado was, it was a reference to the United States. But to me, because I grew up in this um, hometown surrounded by mountains, and I didn't know where the United States was, to me, El Otro Lado was the other side of the mountains. And during the time that my parents were gone, working here in the U.S., I would look at the mountains and think that my parents were over there in the, on the other side of those mountains. So that was El Otro Lado to me. Where did you grow up uh, originally? Where were you born? I was born in Mexico in the state of Guerrero, which is southern Mexico in a little city called Iguala that nobody has heard of. But when I mention Acapulco, everybody knows Acapulco. So Iguala is three hours away from Acapulco. When did your parents come to the United States? How old were you? My father came here in 1977 when I was two years old, and he sent for my mother a few years later. So my mother came here in 1980 when I was four and a half years old. When did you come to the United States? I came to the United States in 1985. How in, old were you? In May of 1985, and I was nine and a half, going, going on ten. What can you tell us about coming to the United States? What was your, what was your trek? Well, I had been separated from my father for eight years. So when he returned to Mexico in 85, my siblings and I convinced him to bring us back here because he wasn't going to come back to Mexico. And we didn't want to spend any more time separated from him. So we begged him to bring us here. And my father didn't really want to bring me because I was nine and a half and he thought I wouldn't be able to make it across the border because we had to run across illegally. So I begged him to bring me here, and um, we took a bus from Mexico City to Tijuana. And I had, right on the border was San yeah, Diego. Yeah, right the border in Tijuana, and um, and it was a very long two-day bus ride because I had rarely been in any kind of cars or any public transportation, and I know I got car sick many many times along the way. But when we got to the border, my father hired a coyote, a smuggler, to bring us across. And What do that, you remember about that experience? Well, what, what I remember is how much walking there was. And, and I remember having a lot of guilt because my father was right. You know, I was too little to be making that kind of crossing. And I would get tired and complain about the walking and about the fact that I was thirsty or hungry and tired. And, my father ended up carrying me a lot of times on his back, and we got caught the first two times by Border Patrol. And I just felt this immense guilt, you know, because I thought it was my fault that we had gotten caught. And then the third time... What happens when you get caught, Reina Grande? Well, when we, get, when, when we got caught, we got loaded up into a van with everyone else that got caught. And then we're taken to the Border Patrol offices and I don't remember a whole lot because because we were children, you know, we weren't really like talked to by by Border Patrol. They would take they would take my father into an office to talk to him. And I remember just waiting for him in the hallway and the Border Patrol people were very nice to us. And, and I remember they even offered to, you know, to get us a soda. So they brought us sodas and we were drinking our soda waiting for our dad. So it, it, was, it was this mixed feeling where, you know, we've been treated very kindly by the Border Patrol, but at the same time, knowing that they were keeping us from crossing and from being able to have a chance at, at having our father back in our lives. Reina Grande, the third time. The third time we crossed the border was... Um, very scary because my father decided to try it in the dead of night, hoping that the darkness would uh, protect us and help us to cross. And he was right. You know, it was pitch black. We couldn't even see where we were going. And a lot of times we were like tripping on rocks and stumbling. Um, and then what I remember most about that border crossing was a helicopter. And there was a helicopter that came by with the searchlight and we were just running for our lives, trying to find a place to hide. And we crawled under the bushes. And I remember that the beam of the light fell on my shoe. And I was praying so hard that the people up there in the cockpit hadn't seen me. And luckily they didn't. So we made it across. Where did you spend that first night? 
Well, the first night, um, well, we made it, by the time we made it across the border, it was dawn. And we walked to the second Coyote's house and he was responsible for driving us to LA. And he made us lie down in the back seat and he wouldn't let us sit up because he said that we could still get pulled over by, by um, Border Patrol. So my siblings and I spent the whole car ride basically lying down. And it wasn't until we got like in Santa Ana when he said, okay, you can get up now. And so that, you know, just seeing all those things outside the window was so amazing. Like, like I remember like all the palm trees and in my hometown, we didn't have palm trees and just the, the streets that seemed to never end and the buildings that seemed to reach the sky. And it was just amazing. It was really amazing. Where did you live in L.A. when you first got here? When I first got to L.A., I lived in Highland Park, which is in Northeast Los Angeles. And it was a predominantly Latino community. Mostly so, illegal? Um, I think it, it was a combination. Yeah, there were a lot of immigrant families, but, you know, there were also the legal and illegal families. How did the uh, legals view the illegals? Uh... I'm not too sure about that because as a child, I don't think I was too aware of that kind of response from the adults. But what I do remember the most is being shocked when I got to school that most of the kids in my classroom were dark skinned and they looked just like me and they had last names like Garcia and Gonzalez and Hernandez and they could speak a language I couldn't speak. And that was really shocking to me because they looked, they looked exactly like me and yet they weren't. And that, I would say that that was probably the first time I was really aware of the fact that they were Latinos, but they were different from, from me. Um, you were in ESL classes, English as a second language classes? Yes. Was that a, were, was that a, was that a second class citizen type thing? Being yeah, in that class? Yeah, definitely. Being an ESL student, you know that that's that's who you are, and that's the way people treat you like an outsider. And it definitely there's a sense of separation because the kids that speak English they hang out in their own circles and then the ESL kids would oftentimes just hang out near the classroom, near the ESL classroom. And um, I, I do remember like wanting to fit in but not being able to because I was an ESL student. But I worked very hard at um, trying to, to finish my ESL classes and get out of that program. So by the time I was in eighth grade, I was enrolled in regular eighth grade English. Reina Grande, there's a picture we're going to show on the air now of you with a uh, saxophone. Tell us that story. The saxophone was something I discovered when I was at Burbank Junior High School in seventh grade. Um, my counselor enrolled me in band. And it's something, it wasn't something that I chose, but they put me there. It was a, an elective, which I didn't elect. <laughs> but I was so lucky to have been put in that class because um, when I walked in there and the teacher said, well, which instrument do you want to play? And at first I thought I had to pay for them. And I say, well, how much does it cost? And when he said, it doesn't cost you anything, it just, it just seemed like the whole world just opened up to me. And I got to choose whichever instrument I wanted and I saw the saxophone and it was so beautiful and that's the one I wanted. Do you still play it today? I don't play anymore, and I haven't played since I graduated from Pasadena City College because I never owned my own sax. And I, when, I, when I went to UC Santa Cruz to study, they, they didn't have marching band, so I didn't, I didn't have anything to join. And then I discovered a whole bunch of other things. You know, I got into uh, folklorical dance, I got into film and video, I got into like all these other things that I was doing. And, and I really missed the saxophone and I wanted to get back into playing. And then I, and one of my teachers pulled me aside one day and she said, you know, Raina, it's really good that you're very creative and that you love to explore and learn new things.
but you need to choose one thing that you want to focus on because otherwise you're going to be a jack of all trades. And I went home that day.